we will be talking about the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea in children and some studies that have been have shown that there are two main mechanisms to developing obstructive sleep, uh, sleep apnea in children specifically. As I've mentioned in my previous video that it's mostly the preschool children that are mainly diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea due to some developmental characteristics and we have concluded that those developmental, developmental characteristics are mostly related to the lymphatic or lymphoid tissue within the upper airways. There was an article published in 2012 that showed that there are two subtypes to obstructive sleep apnea in children specifically that are divided into two groups. So those two subtypes are first related to the lymphatic tissue within the upper airways and are specifically related to the presence of enlarged adenoids and tonsils. And the second group, so-called OSA2 subtype, was related to metabolic changes or metabolic uh, abnormalities within the body that resulted into increased body mass and index and increased in, and uh, just different, uh, different uh, patterns of metabolic reactions within the body. Going back to subtype 1, so adenoids are located in the area of nasopharynx, it's where the nasal passages transition into the pharyngeal airway, and this is where this type of lymphatic tissue is located. If this lymphatic tissue is enlarged, if it's too big, it physically obstructs the airflow from the nasal passages down the upper airway, down into the oropharynx. The other two big components are the tonsils, which are palatine tonsils, and which are located where the pharynx is and it's the uh, is the transition of the mouth cavity into uh, oral into so-called oropharynx or into the pharynx that um, is located just behind uh, the oral cavity item within the lymphatic tissue of the upper airways is the sublingual tonsil or lingual tonsil which also creates uh, a big a disruption on the way of airflow if we're going to talk about the mechanisms and the ways of treatment. As I've mentioned in one of the videos, the study that was published in 2023, even 2022, that, was show, that has show, showed an impact of rapid palatal expansion on the reduction of adenoid and tonsil volume after the palat palatal expansion. The main takeaway of this study is that soft tissues they take a little longer to shrink or to adjust after the maxillary skeletal expansion. Meaning, if the average maxillary skeletal expansion takes up to six months, depending on the protocol, it, it could be either a rapid palatal expansion. And now, just to be clear, we're talking about the fixed uh, maxillary skeletal expanders. We're not talking about any types of removable appliances. We're talking specifically about the fixed expanders, which are non-removable, which are attached to the teeth. You cannot take them out. They are positioned in the mouth at the beginning of the treatment. They stay there without being able to be removed. You have to clean around them and then they are removed at the end of the expansion uh, phase. That expansion can be carried out in two main ways. It's either a rapid palatal expansion protocol when the actual turns or expansion is carried out over a shorter period of time, for example, four to six weeks, and then the rest of the time out of six months is taken for the retention or just keeping the result of expansion stable. That is usually uh, anywhere from four to five months. If the, uh, in the case of a slower expansion, the expansion can be spread out over a longer period of time, for example, four to five months, but at a slower rate, meaning that the turns are not carried out uh, one turn a day or two turns a day. They're carried out or they're spread over this period of time, having two to three turns a week compared to one or two turns a day. This mechanism has different effects and what matters here, the main takeaway here is no matter how the expansion was carried out, there will be effects that uh, will touch the soft tissues around the maxillary area. 
if the uh, if the dimensions of the oral cavity are enlarged that means that they are not only enlarged in the transverse dimension it's not only the width it's also the vertical dimension so the mm, oral cavity is enlarged in all three dimensions increasing this volume the potential volume for the tongue to be positioned that means that there is a more chance there is more chance for the tongue to be positioned correctly relative to the uh, palatal relative to the floor of the mouth and there is less chance for the tongue to collapse the upper airway to collapse against the airway of the pharynx and to collapse against the posterior pharyngeal wall which happens most of the times uh, during those obstructive sleep apnea events when hypopneas uh, happen and when the, when apneas happen that means that it is either a disruption of the airflow a complete disruption a complete uh, stop of the airflow or is a significantly less intense airflow through the passages with subsequent decrease in oxygen saturation and mm, reactions from the rest of the body like increase in uh, heart rate or increase in blood pressure or increased temptation for urination in children. Now we're touching on the bedwetting symptoms, which is a part which were related to the presence of obstructive sleep apnea. If someone notices frequent or more or less frequent bedwetting in their children, in their preschool age children and early school, uh, school age children, that means there is a risk of development of obstructive sleep apnea and there is uh, there are symptoms that are related to the presence of obstructive sleep apnea. These children have to be screened for this uh, condition. Thank you for watching me. It's Dr. Svetlana Koval with Dr. Koval Orthodontics in Boca